Hi, I'm Dan Barker, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. On today's Ask an Atheist, we are celebrating a legal victory, and we're going to tell you how you can take advantage of that victory. If you have questions during today's show, you can post them right here on Facebook, or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And we'll get to questions in, in a few minutes. Earlier this month, a federal judge ruled in our lawsuit that county officials cannot bar atheists from opening board meetings with a secular invocation instead of a prayer. Sam Grover is here today, and he's going to talk about that significant victory in Brevard County, Florida. I hesitated because Rebecca's name was on the screen for a second, and I said, that's not Rebecca. Rebecca is homesick with her kids today. so. Um, but Sam is here, and Sam knows all about it. He'll be taking over. And we also have in our studio, in the Stephen Yule Friendly Atheist Studio today, the editor of FFRS newspaper, Free Thought Today, P.J. Slinger. And this is P.J.'s first time on Ask an Atheist, so be gentle with him. You know, he's just going to get his feet wet on television. He's going to tell us about the Nothing Fails Like Prayer contest that you can join by offering your own secular invocation at a government meeting. So, Sam, thanks for coming in today. You've been really busy. Uh, I saw yesterday you testified at a, uh, a Senate hearing on a bill to, what was that about briefly? Yeah, uh, it was a Wisconsin uh, bill that's been proposed that would uh, limit uh, the UW School of Medicine and Public Health's ability to educate its potential obstetrics and gynecology residents, yeah. um, specifically on um, abortion procedures. So uh, I testified on how uh, the bill had no secular purpose, which is something that we hope for with all government legislation, right? Yeah. A secular purpose uh, with evidence-based reasons. And maybe in a future show we'll play it because one of the senators asked you a pretty, it wasn't even a question, he really was on your case. But let's not spoil that, that was, that was pretty fun how uh, you guys went back and forth. Uh, but you've been busy too, you, the uh, Abbott decision that just came down over Governor Abbott that you, you pretty much drafted that, didn't you? Yeah, uh, that's okay. a big win for us um, mm -hmm. in the uh, district court in Texas over uh, Governor Abbott's censorship of an FFRF holiday display in the Texas Capitol. And we won that one, and we'll talk about that one on another show, but that was really delicious to go after the governor. But today we want to talk about uh, Florida, Brevard County, Florida, uh, a victory that we just had uh, October the 2nd, I think it was, earlier this month. It just came down. So set up this case. What happened in Brevard County? Why were we suing, and what was our victory? Well, um, before we get to Brevard County, you sort of need the legal backdrop, uh, which begins with uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Town of Greece v. Galloway. Greece. Greece. Like, town of Greece. Town okay. of Greece v. Galloway, uh, which um, was a decision basically saying that it's okay for uh, city government to open its meetings with uh, clergy-led prayer. And we don't like that decision, but... That's the law, right? Yeah, that is the law. Um, but the Greece decision also noted that the town of Greece never uh, excluded a would-be prayer giver uh, or invocation giver from uh, delivering the opening invocation, including an atheist. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we had representatives uh, in Brevard County ask to give opening invocations because the Brevard County Board uh, was allowing clergy members to lead prayers at the starts of their meetings. So the Greece decision used the word atheist specifically? Yes, yeah, it did. So the uh, Greece decision said, the Supreme Court said you cannot exclude atheists, but that's what the county in Florida was doing. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the county actually, um, once we got into this lawsuit, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, the county commissioners actually made a lot of very confusing statements about uh, what their qualifications for someone to lead this prayer would be. Um, one commissioner said uh, that she would only allow um, monotheistic uh, religions to lead the invocation. Um, one explicitly said um, only Christians could lead the invocation because um, they're a Christian community in her mind. Um, other uh, commissioners were asked specifically about um, polytheistic religions. Um, one said that they uh, would never allow a Hindu to deliver 
a prayer. Another one said that they wouldn't allow polytheistic religions to, to deliver a prayer, but would allow a Hindu. Huh. So um, there, there was a lot of confusion uh, about uh, the different religious leaders um, within the community uh, who might deliver a prayer. Maybe the Hindu who says, there's a lot of gods, but Vishnu is my one god. Maybe that would get by. <laughs> I have no <clears throat> idea, no earthly <clears throat> idea, and apparently neither did the commissioners have any real idea uh, what was going on here, um, what, what the limits of government inquiry into um, a person's religious beliefs are. Um, in reality, uh, none of this is permissible. It's not permissible for a government official to uh, delve into the specific religious or non-religious beliefs of a person in order to allow them to receive a government benefit like uh, giving the opening uh, invocation. Is that a benefit? Yeah, uh, I would say so. Uh, being able to represent uh, yourself and your beliefs uh, at a government meeting um, like this. Uh, and actually, uh, the commissioners thought of it as a benefit too. One commissioner said um, that uh, invocations are re reserved for faith-based organizations to introduce their church. Ah. It gives them an opportunity to promote their church. Well, that's, that's a so. quote. So, um, yeah, there, there's a real benefit here, um, and atheists were being denied that benefit. We have a really <clears throat> active chapter in Central Florida, the Central Florida Free Thought Community. community. Uh, uh, David Williamson uh, and the many people there are active. Are they the people who asked to give a non-religious invocation? Yes, so there were a few <clears throat> different plaintiffs in this case. Uh, the Central Florida Free Thought Community, David Williamson were both there. Uh, the Space Coast Free Thought Association and its president, the humanist community of the Space Coast and its president, and then we had a, a local Brevard County resident as well. So because of that, we had what they call injury, right? We had standing to go into court, and we went into court, and was the standing upheld? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, we, we had the standing to sue um, because there's a real injury in being excluded from this invocation practice. And um, uh, we, we're happy uh, to have um, filed this case uh, with uh, the ACLU, ACLU of Florida, and um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Now, you well. were working on it somewhat, but it was mainly Rebecca Markert and, and Andrew Seidel and Andrew who Seidel. worked. But the whole staff works on these things when we file these lawsuits. So what was the decision? Well, uh, the, uh, the d district court decided uh, earlier this month, as you said, that um, no, the county can't exclude atheists. So they can't exclude their practice to monotheistic religions or, um, or exclude non-believers from equal participation. So they're going to go and pray now? Or they're going to appeal, right, do you think? Uh, you know, we, we don't know yet. Uh -huh. um, uh, my understanding is that um, the county's attorney is something of a firebrand um, and, will, and has already made statements saying that uh, he wants to appeal, but uh, I, d I think the county would do well to ignore uh, that sort of biased advice and take a good hard look at what the law actually requires. And besides that, it's expensive. Yeah, uh, ultimately it's the taxpayer's dime. And um, using county resources to fight something, to basically try to preserve discrimination uh, within the county is um, really a bad use of resources. They have 30 days from the decision? Yep, so we'll be watching to see what they do uh, and maybe also talking about the, talking to the county to see uh, if they want to resolve this. So maybe on November 2nd, which is Annie Lloyd's birthday, by the way, maybe, we'll, maybe they won't appeal and we'll have a strong victory. That's really great. So um, <clears throat> uh, in this same regards, we have in the studio with us P.J. Slinger. P.J. is uh, editor of Free Thought Today, what, for two years now? How long have you yep, been? Just over two years now. Wow, and if you like the new look of the paper, it's PJ mm -hmm. and uh, Roger and the, the editorial staff who have really been working hard on Free Thought Today with a 24, last month was 28, wasn't it? Uh, pages? 28 pages? Uh, 32. 32 pages, wow, so jam-packed. And a lot of it are these victories that we're covering. Um, but um, in regards to prayer, um, we have something called a Nothing Fails Like Prayer contest in regards to government prayer. So can you explain that for us? Sure. Um, you know, where a government body will start a meeting, often they'll have uh, the religious invocation or prayer. Um, 
and in the in after Greece versus Galloway, which you know you guys were just talking about, uh, FFR have decided you know what we should send our atheists and our non-believers in to give invocations to to uh, test it to test, test sure yeah to make sure that this isn't mm -hmm. just for Christians or religious believers, um, and this is kind of where we also find out like with David Williamson in the you know the Central Florida that they're not allowed to do it. So that's one way to find out what your local community is doing regarding that. So like at your city council or county board or even your state houses, um, individuals can go and apply to give an invocation. You know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be religious or but, it shouldn't have to be religious. But only in those places where they're actually doing it, right? Because yes, not yeah, all cities we're not, are we're doing not this. trying to start something new and say, hey, we need to do this. Well, don't give them any ideas, right? Yeah. So because they're not, you know, eliminating all invocations, we're saying, well, it should be on us now to join them. Um, so we, we have every, you know, for the last three, four years now, had people going up and uh, either through us or at our behest to give invocations. Um, a lot of really great ones, and every year we pick out a winner or maybe a couple winners for uh, to be honored at our convention. So, um, what I'm here to do is tell you if you're interested in uh, giving an invocation at your local board, uh, let them know. You know, just call them up or write them and say, "Hey, I would like to be on your list of." Uh, people to give invocations and then they will undoubtedly ask you know who you're representing or what you're going to speak about and that's where you find out if indeed they would let you speak um, and if they do please do it it would be great and if you do then contact us uh, through our website uh, ffrf.org and then uh, nothing fails like prayer with hyphens between e each word uh, not the easiest but even if you just go to ffrf.org you'll be able to find it pretty easily um, so what's the contest? What um, people send in the video and they they win something? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you can win uh, expenses paid trip to the following year's convention, which next year will be in uh, beautiful San Francisco. Wow. Okay. Uh, Five hundred dollars, which is pretty nice, and uh, in a plaque. And when you come to the convention, you get to deliver your. Yes. When. Yep. There. Uh, Usually during the uh, Saturday morning uh, non-prayer breakfast, you get to deliver the invocation huh. that you gave, your award-winning invocation as it would be at that point. You get to do it again. Well, here's one. Uh, I think it's Scott uh, who gave an invocation. Here's a sample of one of the invocations. Rather than bowing your heads and closing your eyes tonight, I instead ask that everyone in this chamber keep their heads up and eyes open so that we can all appreciate the amount of amazing human potential gathered in this room tonight. Much of the work performed tonight will require great discussion, passionate debate, and in some cases, an agreement to disagree. But through this experience, the mayor and council had the humbling opportunity to represent all people of this great city fairly, regardless of their socioeconomic status, their race, their gender identity or sexual preferences, or even their religious or non-religious worldview. These elected leaders should make decisions that refrain from putting one group above another while always seeking to provide the, minor the minority opinion equal footing as the majority. I encourage the mayor, council, and citizens in this room tonight to harness the power of humanity, relying only on reason, observation, and experience in the decisions that get made tonight, rather than relying on doctrine, tradition, or any deeply held belief. The only higher power to rely on in these chambers should come from within each of us. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this great thought from Dan Barker, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Quote, you are all intelligent human beings. Your life is valuable for its own sake. You are not second class in the universe, deriving meaning <clears throat> excuse me, and purpose from some other mind. You are not inherently evil. You are inherently human possessing the positive, rational potential to help make this a world of morality, peace, and joy. Trust yourself. Wow, that was a great quote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I really like that. <laughs> Amazing. And Justin was one of our winners, right? Yep, last year he won. Do we have more to see here? Yeah, we do. Uh, the next one, I believe, is from Brooke Mulder, who 
gave this one, uh, the one, the clip we'll see is uh, her, after receiving her award, giving it at the convention two years ago in, in Madison. Okay. Let us all take a moment to reflect on why we are here tonight. If you're here, you may have chosen a path of serving your electorate to the benefit of their welfare, or you may have concerns you've chosen to bring in front of the council. We should be grateful that the city of Glendale has those who are willing to serve and those who trust in the system enough to participate in the process. It is people like those that enable us to truly govern ourselves. My principles as a secular humanist teach me to rely on reason and our common humanity. A city council is an excellent illustration of how people can come together without supernaturalism to provide meaningful changing, changes in each other's lives. I would like to leave you with a final thought from Thomas Jefferson. Educate and inform the whole mass of the people. Enable them to see that it is their interest to preserve peace and order, and they will preserve them. Thank you. So, Brooke, uh, that was in Glendale, Arizona, yes. right? Yes, uh, and what I liked about that was before, right before that clip, she walked up and took, uh, got the award and said uh, that she does not like speaking in front of people but, um, and felt much more comfortable in front of the FFRF crowd, even though there was probably you know, 500 people there as opposed to how many people at a city council meeting. Yeah. But yet, she was still brave enough to go and give the invocation in front of the city council. Wow, well it does take some courage, I think, to stand out yeah. like that. And so, she quoted Thomas Jefferson, which puts you in good company. That's right, that's huh, <laughs> Jefferson. Well, we're different, different generations is mm -hmm. what, what it is, but. <laughs> One, oh, one, one generation apart? I think we're a generation apart, yeah. Um, so I guess our next one is, uh, our clip is from Tom Waddell, who uh, gave his invocation this current year in the Maine State House, which is a pretty big deal. Maine as in the state of Maine. The state of Maine, yep. Wow, okay, let's look at that one. Traditionally, invocations have served uh, to encourage lawmakers to put aside political differences and under the guidance of a higher power, work together for the common goal of making Maine a better place for all of its citizens. This secular invocation will be no different, but I will not ask you to bow your heads to a higher power. Instead, I ask that you look around to the learned men and women assembled here together and rely on each other's collective honesty, character, and integrity for guidance in making decisions that fulfill the intent of the main constitution, specifically to promote our common welfare. And that was good, and he delivered it also at our convention as well. Yes. So, so this is the kind of thing that Brevard County was disallowing, right? This kind of a secular speech. Exactly, which is especially um, unfortunate because these secular invocations really do speak to everyone uh, who's there at the meeting, right? Um, there, there's nothing in any of these invocations that's objectionable, even if you are religious. Whereas if you're giving an, a, a prayer to a higher power that only some people believe in, you have excluded a significant portion, one in three Americans, or um, sorry, one in five Americans, or one in three young, young Americans uh, from, from enjoying that invocation or feeling included. I think I read, it might have been in the Greece decision, that the purpose of these prayers or invocations, or whatever you call that, is to solemnize the occasion, right? To bring some gravity to the occasion. So why is a supernatural the only way to solemnize? Why are those values the only good values? What about the values of human beings and those values that we just heard them talk about? Why can't that equally solemnize? And why should you be disallowed for doing that in your own public meeting, just because you don't believe in a ghost in the sky, right? Yeah, great question. Do we have some more, or is that it? Uh, no, we have uh, one more. Um, this is David Suhor of the Satanic Temple. Uh, he gave this last year at the Pittsburgh Convention, FFRF Convention, uh, and I think you're going to get a kick out of it. Let us stand now 
unbowed and unfettered. By arcane doctrines born of fearful minds in darkened times, let us embrace the Luciferian impulse to eat of the tree of knowledge and dissipate are blissful and comforting delusions of old. <laughs> Let us demand that individuals be judged for their concrete actions, not their fealty to arbitrary social norms. <laughs> categorizations. Let us reason our solutions with agnosticism in all things, holding fast only to that which is demonstrably true. Let us stand firm against any and all arbitrary authority that threatens the personal sovereignty of one or all. That which will not bend must break, and that which can be destroyed by truth should never be spared. So that took some courage. He actually performed that at his, what, city council yep, meeting? in Pensacola, Florida. In Pensacola, Florida, where they had that big cross. So uh, just in case some of you viewers might be a little confused, the Church of Satan is really not satanic. It's, uh, <laughs> they're, they're mostly non-believers, but they use that for an edge to try to get in. And if you listen to the words of that, it was, you know, basically human values. Yes. Uh, and that music was the music to um, the Lord's Prayer. Some of you might not know that, that melody from the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. so he was putting uh, satanic words to the Lord's Prayer. So he was one of our winners. So some of you might want to do the same thing. Uh, you, you can win a, a all expense trip paid to our annual convention where you can deliver your secular invocation or whatever you want to call it, pagan prayer, it doesn't matter. Uh, if that's allowed, and send us a video of it, and we will judge. Are you part of the judging team? Uh, PJ? I am. PJ yes. is going to judge. Uh, uh, do you have any hints about how they might win the thing? Uh, extra money and made out to me. That yeah, usually works. Personally. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm, not a, I'm not above bribery. Do, do you think, <laughs> you know, if you ever did it, if you ever did the opening invocation, I know what your religion is. It's the Packers. Yeah. Right? So would you like yep. give like an invocation to Aaron Rodgers or well, something? Our, our God has fallen. Oh, really? Oh, he's yeah. injured. That's yes. right, huh? Well, can't you do some faith healing to get, <laughs> get him back? That would be something. Um, go up to Green Bay if they ever open Green Bay uh, City Council with a prayer. Yes. So um, so we take some questions here. Um, did you want to say anything else about any of that? Think okay, we've covered it. No, I, I, I guess I would just add uh, for anyone who felt uncomfortable with a, a, a satanic invocation, um, I, that's sort of the point, right? Um, in the fact that uh, if prayers at these meetings are exclusively Christian, well, you've um, you've made a significant portion of the country feel uncomfortable with that. A significant portion of your local community, um, you know. Uh, 30% nationally, 43% uh, of young Americans are non-Christian. Uh, so, yeah, it's food for thought. So, you know, in the Bible, um, the God of the Bible is responsible for many, many thousands of deaths. 
you know, genocides and infanticides. And if you consider the flood alone, there was probably about 20 million people who died in that. Do you know how many people Satan is responsible for killing in the Bible? Do you know? I do not zero? know. Zero? It's not zero. It's 10. It was Job's 10 children. And uh -huh. even then he had to do it with God's permission. So which is better, God or Satan, when it comes to morality, I would, I would ask. They would both make, both make me feel uncomfortable. You should write a book about that. I should write a book about that. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> Maybe one of these days we'll talk about that. So we have some questions, and, and Lauren Searing helped us set this up here. Uh, here's a question. It uh, looks like it came through Facebook. Uh, Martha Swenson asks, is, there's a question of vocabulary. The Christian community understands the word invocation as invoking, invoking the presence of God in the assembly and its deliberations. With this victory, should the same word be used, or how could that word be redefined? One thought, perhaps, to invoke the presence of wisdom and values. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I think um, invocation is uh, certainly a, a more all-encompassing term than, than prayer, uh, though you can give a secular prayer as well, uh, one could argue. Um, I think there are many things worthy of being invoked, uh, our shared humanity, uh, wisdom, as the question asker suggested. Yeah. Um, I think uh, invisible sky father is probably not worthy of being invoked, but that's my opinion. But if an American does believe that, they're welcome to at least say those words, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's under-inclusive, but um, yeah, certainly you're allowed to invoke whatever it is you believe in. I think what Mar Marcia is asking here is that you, you see a lot of church services and liturgies, and they have the word invocation and then benediction. They're actually kind of in the religious rituals themselves, and so that word invocation has taken on a kind of a, what, ritual religious feeling. But you're right, to invoke just means to ask for the assistance of somebody outside of yourself. And you could be invoking those lawmakers. We invoke your wisdom and your uh, benefits. Yeah, so I mean, it, certainly the, the word invocation sort of primes people to think about religious speech. Uh, so I guess we would recommend opening remarks uh, or as something. an alternative, uh, or solemnizing statement. Yeah, solemnizing. Yeah. You know, um, I was trying to look up if the government actually has a definition of the word prayer, and I can't find it. The only thing I could find is in the legal dictionaries, to pray the court is to ask for a relief, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's not asking for a God, right? No. And I think it was the Greece decision, or maybe it was, it was Marsh. I think it was Marsh that said, uh, um, you can't, the prayer cannot proselytize. In other words, it tells us what it is not. But do you think there's a legal definition in our government or in a statute about what the word prayer actually means anywhere? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Is so, that a loophole then? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's kind of, uh, it, it's open f for debate, um, though at the end of the day, uh, part of what the Establishment Clause stands for um, is that government should not be entangled in religious questions. Uh, so defining what a prayer is is ultimately a religious question, and I think the government should not be in that business. So we could define a prayer, if we wanted to, with a lowercase p as what we just saw happen that these people gave, right? Uh, yeah. Or a prayer to Aaron Rodgers. Could you, could you do that? <laughs> uh, isn't that a Hail Mary? Yeah, well, he's, he's the expert at those as well. Yeah. Okay, so another question here. Uh, Eric Harrison asks... What if I wanted to do a fake Satanist prayer instead, just to freak them all out? Well, I can take this one. Sure. I mean, I think that's kind of what David Suhor did. I mean, I mean, he he did it as a, as a. Under the guise of the Satanic Temple, but it was a very secular invocation. So I don't know if he's, uh, this writer is is saying do something very satanic and, you know, worshiping devil and stuff. I suppose you can do that, but I think that uh, maybe goes a little too far. You know, we're not trying to, uh, well, maybe not. I mean, it just feels like we're not trying to go that far. We're just trying to show, you know, that 
we want to be part of this too, and we don't want a discrimination of religions or whatever. And to go that far, I feel like that's just kicking them, you know, when they're down, kind of. So. Well, is, so is, is the uh, the question asker characterizing this as a, a fake uh, Satanist invocation, just in the sense that they don't believe in that? Because um, I, I think it's in, important to um, put a positive face on non-belief. Um, I, I I definitely see the uh, um, allure. Yeah, the allure to to just sticking it in their face and saying, you know, most of the prayers that um, open these meetings uh, make me feel uncomfortable. Here's one that I guarantee will make you feel uncomfortable. Um, but I, I think it's more valuable to put a positive face on atheism and the atheist movement and show that uh, we have secular values that everyone can believe in. So I guess I would say to Eric that as he says, just to freak them all. If that's your purpose, you're going in there just to freak them all out. Well, the, the, the point of the prayer invocation is to solemnize an occasion, right? That's what it's supposed to be. So it would not be appropriate in that context to go in to, just to freak them all out, I don't think. No matter what we do, it's going to freak them out, whether, you know, whether that's our intention or not. In a public forum, on the other hand, we do have the right to ridicule and freak out and say, you know, our, our Abbott decision pointed that out. Even if the government doesn't like it, we can say things that are, you know, outrageous. But in a government meeting where you're trying to solemnize the gravity of some deliberative body, maybe if you're going in just to freak them all out, that would not be appropriate. Well, it might not be appropriate, but it's also certainly legal. Um, and what we see often with these opening invocations is that they're invoking uh, Christian ideas of morality and hell, eternal damnation, yeah. that... Uh, should freak people out or yeah. disturb them in the sense that, um, like, why are, you, why are you suggesting that I'm going to burn eternally for these secular humanist beliefs that I yeah. have? Yeah, but Jesus died for you. You don't have to burn eternally. <laughs> don't you get the love of the... I'm going back to my preacher mode. Yeah. So, so um, all right. So now, Kimberly Rivest or Revest, she asked, she sent an email to us. She said, how long does it usually take to set up a secular prayer, she put that in quotes, in your local community? Well, I guess set up, I assume she means, you know, contacting your local board or whatever. I think that's probably different on a case to case basis where, you know, you can contact your city council and say, can I give an invocation? And they'll say, sure, put it on the list and, you know, you get to go December 18th or something. Yeah. Uh, others might be longer out, or you might have to fill out some forms. You know, each each one I'm sure is different in its own way. So uh, there's there's no yeah. single answer to that one. Yeah. And maybe there's calendars already scheduled for. Uh... I was going to say I've I've dealt with at least one county that scheduled it six months out. Oh, so wow. um, that basically each invocation giver was going up to two times a year. Um, so uh, try to. You know, make the inquiry as soon as possible, and uh, and then if it doesn't work with your schedule uh, to to do one right away, um, at least you're on yeah. their radar. Wasn't the town of Greece? Maybe I'm confusing something, but wasn't Greece? Weren't they ac actively going out to the local churches and and say soliciting the prayer from the local ministers in town? Wasn't yeah, that yeah. This is um, one of the problems with most of these invocation practices is that. Uh, the city or county officials uh, are envisioning this as a Christian prayer. And so they're going to actively seek out Christian religious leaders to fulfill uh, that part of the ceremony. Uh, and so often uh, from the beginning, from the get-go, it's only Christian religious leaders on this list. Or, you know, maybe they also say, they, they look in the phone book and say, oh, okay, great, we have two synagogues and we're going to, you know, reach out to them as well. But the way you get um, diverse invocations that represent the actual cross-section of the community is uh, by everyone being allowed to participate and knowing about uh, the option. So the, um, the city wasn't picking up free thought today and looking to see if we have an FFRF chapter in their town. Oh, we should invite them as well. So we have to be proactive about it, basically, is what yeah. you're saying, right? Uh, we have time for some more. Oh, Richard Hellas. Hi, Richard. Richard says, I really like the fact 
Uh, a number of watchdog organizations have teamed up against state church violations. When I file my next violation with the Freedom from Religion Foundation, should I also file the same complaint with American Atheists, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, the ACLU, etc.? So maybe you can talk a little bit about how we're teaming up with other groups. Yeah, um, there are a number of issues that we're proud to work with these other uh, free thought, uh, state church separation or free speech groups uh, like Americans United, ACLU, American Humanist Association, uh, American Atheists, Secular Student Alliance, I, I could go on, CFI, uh, Center for Inquiry. Um, for, for the most part, we, we write thousands of letters a year, uh, and in that sense, I, I think um, we're the most prolific free thought organization in terms of letter writing. Um, and well, nine attorneys, and we have nine full-time attorneys, yes. and very bright attorneys, by the way. Right. Um, so uh, we, we can't possibly reach out to these other groups for each of our letters. Um, it takes a lot more time to, you know, uh, to come up with a joint uh, strategy for a letter. Uh, with the Brevard situation, um, as I mentioned earlier, we had multiple plaintiffs, uh, and so uh, these other groups were able to bring in additional uh, plaintiffs to help us out, and that's why it was a, a great opportunity to work with other groups on that one. Um, and so I would encourage uh, people to contact FFRF and uh, let us uh, figure out if it's a situation where we need other groups. Do you think if Richard is contacting other groups as well, he should let us know that so we won't duplicate, you know what I mean? So the groups aren't doing the same reinventing? Yes, yeah. Um, we have limited resources as a nonprofit um, and as do the other nonprofits that we work with regularly. Um, so contacting one group is probably the best way uh, to ensure that we're not uh, overusing our resources on any one issue. Uh, and we're very capable of reaching out to these other groups uh, when the time comes. Well, we need them sometimes because they have a chapter or they have an attorney in that area that's very useful to us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're all wonderful groups that we enjoy working with. So uh, there's at least one more question. Um, Thomas Poole, he sent an email asking, why is it important for atheists to have secular invocations in the first place? Wouldn't you rather just stop the prayer to begin with? Yeah, I, I think I can field this one yeah. in two parts. Um, the, the first would be, um, from a legal standpoint, the Supreme Court has spoken on this through Marsh v. Chambers uh, and then Town of Greece v. Galloway. Um, invocations are legal. Um, FFRF doesn't like that uh, as the state of the law, but that's the legal landscape within which we have to work. So we can't stop invocations entirely from a legal standpoint through lawsuits or things like that. So if you can't beat them, join them. That's the first point. The second point um, is that just because it's legal doesn't mean it's wise, right? Um, all of these individual uh, communities could opt for something that's more inclusive than an opening invocation. Every opening invocation, or most opening invocations, are going to uh, ostracize someone, right? Uh, so it doesn't really make sense to say, all right, well, everyone's welcome, and at each month, we're going to ostracize a different segment of the population by opening up the invocation practice to everyone. Instead, um, maybe something like a moment of silence, uh, right, where everyone has a moment to reflect in their own way on what's going on, that seems like a much more wise uh, solemnizing opening policy to me. Or like we do at our annual convention and our annual non-prayer breakfast, instead of a moment of silence, we have a moment of bedlam. Who says you cannot solemnize an occasion with bedlam? How do you solemnize a football game? Aren't they screaming rah, rah, yeah, yeah, yeah? I mean, isn't that kind of another way? It's bedlam. Yeah, there mm -hmm. you go. So uh, why does it have to be this quiet kind of, you know, kind of thing? Um, so I think that's the last question, but I want to talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned Marsh. Yeah. Marsh v. Chambers, and Ch Ernie Chambers was the Nebraska senator who challenged prayers before the Nebraska... Was and still is. Yeah, he still is in there, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they just have a one house, don't they, in yes. Nebraska? Yes, unicameral. So that was 1983? Something like that. Put Marsh me on the spot, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> about then. I think the Marsh decision was 83, and in that decision there's a phrase that... And 
I know most of us don't like the Marsh decision because it was based on history, which we think was bad history. Yeah. But it said the uh, the legislative prayer is a tolerable acknowledgement of widely held beliefs. That was the phrase in the Marsh decision, which is quoted a lot. And when they say it's tolerable, they're admitting that you don't say something's tolerable unless you're questioning whether it's even appropriate, right? But yeah. they're saying, well, this is a tolerable acknowledgement of widely held beliefs. Back at our founding, the widely held beliefs of Christians was like this, 98%. Even back at Marsh, the widely held beliefs, what, Christianity was in the 80% or something? Right. Today, the widely held beliefs are like this. And why aren't we a quarter of the population? Why aren't our widely held beliefs now just as welcome at the table as, as all the rest of them? Exactly. Especially when our widely held secular beliefs are really held by everyone. Um, I, I don't think anyone objects to the principles of equality and compassion, the types of things that get invoked in a secular invocation. Very good. Anything else, uh, PJ? Nope. Sam's, uh, Sam says it all. Sam, Sam says it. Sam's very articulate. Yes, he is. I try to be. Well, we, you're both very talented in uh, getting that paper out every month. Uh, you know, I used to do Much that job. Much better behind the scenes than in front of the camera. You know, I used to do that job, you know, back when we yep. had a small staff, and it was, I know how hard it is. And now with the full color and 32 pages or whatever it is, uh, pretty amazing. So if, uh, if you're not a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and you don't get free thought today that PJ edits, uh, you can join us. Go to ffrf.org and sign up as a member. You'll get 10 free issues of Free Thought Today, which report on all these victories. It used to be that uh, once a month we would have like a big story on the front page. Now there's so many victories. In the last two weeks, what, four? Four victories or so that came through. Four, and four lawsuit victories. Four lawsuit yeah, in, victories. In the last two weeks. Not counting the victories that came from uh, just from writing letters. So sign up, become a member. You can support our work. And uh, what are we talking about next week on Ask an Atheist? We'll tell you. We'll announce it on Monday <laughs> or Tuesday. Uh, you can tune in next, next Wednesday at 12 noon Central Time for Ask an Atheist. So I'm Dan Barker with PJ Slinger and Sam Grover. And thank you for watching Ask an Atheist. Freedom.